I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, and may more light and more truth break forth from your holy word. Amen. Over these last few weeks, we've been hearing a number of testimonies to the power of our prayer shawl ministry. Our prayer shawl knitters get together about twice a month to knit shawls that get sent near and far. People are going through difficult times and these shawls are really powerful demonstrations of love and the way that love keeps us knit together. So I thought in talking about love today, it's such a big topic that maybe I could talk a little bit about knitting. So the first thing that, uh, that I like to do when I'm thinking about knitting is look at yarns because there is nearly an infinite supply of yarn, different types, different shapes of yarns. Um, some of the yarns are fairly plain. <laughs> so, so I've got examples of a pretty plain yarns. You can pass these around if you like. We'll see how far we can get them back there. Some of the yarns get a little fancier. There's cotton yarn and there's wool yarn. There's even some silk yarn. You see some of these yarns vary in their width and textures. Some of the yarns vary in their colors quite a bit. And because I'm not a very good knitter, I like to go for the fancy yarns because that makes it look like I'm doing something really cool. Some more examples, a lot of these, some of these are machine dyed. Some of these are hand dyed. Whoa, my softball skills. There we go. Some of these yarns actually don't look like yarn at all, but are instead, this one's a little harder, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand it out. <laughs> some of them are more like uh, ribbons. This is a yarn that's made up of a bunch of different kinds of silks. And I was thinking about these yarns in terms of the stories of John and Jesus because while they had a lot in common, we would get some yarn over to the band. <laughs> Woo! Oh, <laughs> sorry, Maureen. <laughs> it's, yes, please. At least you were sitting. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad she's in my band because I know she'll forgive me. Um, so John and Jesus, born uh, very close to the same time. We know from Scripture that the time that um, Mary was told that she was pregnant with Jesus, Elizabeth was pregnant with John. They were cousins. They were contemporaries. They were very much involved in the same mission of getting people into right relationship with God, but they did so in very different ways. John comes on the scene, and he's kind of got a rock star persona going on. He's got really uh, unique clothing, camel's hair. He um, eats only wild locusts and honey, which was a diet of excessive purity, actually, but, you know, it's a, rock stars can kind of have odd diets. He had a really big following amongst the major leaders of his day. He kept um, appearing in front of Herod, King Herod. And what was interesting about these multiple appearances in front of Herod is that they were insult fests. You know, they were, without being funny, because John was very critical of the way Herod was living his life, um, John was so critical of what was going on, but Herod kept on wanting John to come back for more. When it comes to um, extra canonical readings of the time, so historians who've written about this time, there are more instances of references to John because he hung out with the wealthy and mighty, many more references to John than there are to Jesus. And what was interesting about this, because John got such big crowds and because he was so, uh, he had such an edge to his message, there were a lot of people who expected that John, in fact, was the Messiah. 
and they wanted him to take on that role of being the savior for his people. Now John knew he was not called to be the Messiah, at least our gospel reading says so today, but it speaks to this idea, what is salvation about? Because a Messiah is the savior, the Christ, all of these words that are used interchangeably. Messiah was a very specific word. It meant he was going to save us by overcoming the current political structure of the day. So the expectation was that the Messiah was going to overthrow the Romans. So the contemporaries for John and Jesus were looking for someone who would do that. Now John didn't do that. John preached uh, repentance. He called people to reconsider their lives. But he did so in a very big kind of flashy way. Jesus, when he started his ministry, stayed away from the capital cities, stayed away from the high and mighty. It was really much more about preaching to the outskirts, to the people who did not have direct contact with the temple so that he could start with them and tell a story about salvation that was very different from the one they expected to hear. We totally can understand people wanting to see the overthrow of the Roman government and their Jewish collaborators. They were being taxed very heavily. They had no freedom. Their their, uh, cultural norms were being violated all the time. We have the experience in our country of wanting to or having the opportunity to change our government every two to four years. And I love our democracy and wouldn't want to see it changed, but in terms of actually changing, having, bringing about radical improvement to the way people lives our, the way we live our lives, our system can't move like that. We move much in much smaller steps in much smaller increments. So that's one of the reasons why when we have a major election and major change doesn't come, so many of us become so disappointed. Jesus, in his salvation, what he was about, was about bringing about the way and the practice of love because he knew and he taught that the only truly transformative, the only true revolutionary way to bring about change in in people's lives is by bringing about greater love. So John and Jesus kind of work like yarns do sometimes. This scarf has a couple of different yarns in it One is really flashy, it's got really bright bits, and the other is is fairly plain, little variation in color. But I suggest that John and Jesus kind of knit together their ministry much like the way that scarf is knit put together. There was some flash, there was some sizzle, there was quite a bit of substance and texture as well. So salvation, in terms of our stories, in terms of Jesus and John's story, was not about what people expected in terms of a revolutionary overthrow, but about this practice of love. And that's where our second reading comes in, from Thessalonians. In that, Paul is telling people, giving people instructions about how to be loving toward each other. I have a couple of things here. This scarf is the first item I ever knit. So I used big, chunky yarns, and you can see the mistakes that I made in joining these sections together. But it shows that it's possible to knit together people's lives, sometimes in ways that are um, different from each other. Sometimes our colors look different from each other. But it's a fairly simple pattern. Now this is a blanket that was knit for me. A friend of mine in Bellingham My friend up there in Bellingham is a mathematician. He does this to relax. (laughs) So you can see there's quite a bit of complexity in this pattern. It's all one color. It's all very humble yarn, but it's a very complicated pattern. And that's kind of, to me, another thing of, another example of what love can look like. Love can look very simple and be in very simple patterns, or it can be very complicated. But all knitting comes down to is points of connection and points, 
spaces that are left in between. Even in this scarf, a scarf that my friend who knitted it for me calls me her Tickle Me Elmo scarf. It's a very fancy yarn, but you can see there are points of connection, and then there are spaces in between. Now, points of connection, when it comes to our loving relationships with friends or family members, points of connection are easy to understand. There's the experiences that we have together, the conversations that we have together, those points where our lives touch and intersect. What sometimes becomes difficult to understand is the necessity for spaces in between, for people to have their own interests, for people to have their own other relationships, for people to have their own ability to explore their spirituality, their interests, and spaces. And I think sometimes the problems that we encounter in relationships is that we either get too knotted up in those points of connection where we have misunderstandings and we have hurt feelings and all that gets knotted up. Or we don't pay enough attention to developing those spaces in between. Now sometimes it's the other issue that we allow too much of the spaces in between. And in fact, that's what leaves our relationships to become unraveled. I think about this because I really do believe that love is the only power that saves us. Not from a hell, that's an afterlife destination. I'm not too worried about that. But what I do know is that there seems to be a hell of a lot of loneliness and suffering, anxiety, and fear. And I think that when it comes down to making a difference in the world, what our power to do is to knit our lives together, to knit these prayer shawls together, to knit our relationships back together, to make sure that those points of connections are even, but to make sure that the spaces in between are there as well. And I hope that we can remember during these last couple of weeks before Christmas when things get a little nutty, when we can feel the gap too much or we feel the tension too tautly. What we remember to do is stick to our knitting and create more love in the world. Amen.